In this roundup of the week, the final presidential debate takes place against the backdrop of highly partisan media reporting, the UK throws more areas into Covid lockdown, and the data shows that the coronavirus doesn't, after all, care about the colour of your skin. My name is Malin Baker. This is the Malin Baker Show for Changemakers. Welcome back to the metaphorical slippery slope that is 2020. I hope you're well. We've certainly seen a pretty remarkable week heading into the second US presidential debate. For one thing, President Trump, now released from his COVID experience, was tearing around numerous rallies trying to make up for lost time. For most of the week, Joe Biden was out of circulation, reportedly preparing for the debate. Instead, we had his former boss, Barack Obama, campaigning on his behalf. Now, you can love or hate Obama's politics, but it was a startling reminder what it's like to have a campaign speech delivered by someone who can talk fluently and in complete sentences. He was in good attacking form. I'm sure the faithful will feel that he landed blows on the other side. But I wonder if I was the only one drawing a not especially flattering comparison with the, you know, the actual candidate. Now, the the real sense of unreality in the run-up to the debate was just how hard one side of pushing the Hunter Biden story and how determinedly the mainstream media were in putting their fingers in their ears and shouting, I can't hear you. I mean, personally, I think attempting to reveal just before the election some particular dirt on your opponent is dark and disreputable campaigning. I get that there's a case for it. I think it damages the whole political process. But the story coming through the New York Post has been gaining a degree of credibility. Nobody's denied that the emails that have been seized are genuine. At least one credible person involved has attested to their validity and agreed with speculation that Joe Biden is directly referred to as having benefited from a somewhat shady deal while he was vice president. If that story had Donald Trump's name attached to it, you know that the media would have been all over it, even if they'd suspected it had been made up by Russia, I suspect. At the very least, you'd think they'd be asking about it. I mean, properly, critically looking into it. You're about to elect this person as president, according to the polls, anyway. I get that you hate the other guy, and you don't want him to win. Does that really mean you're going to suspend even an appearance of objectivity in the last few weeks? But nope. No serious coverage given to that story. When journals like the New York Times have to mention it, as they did in anticipating it would be brought up by Trump during the debate, they simply referred to them as unproven or questionable. That's it. No interest or curiosity. It's just some fake thing that Trump is likely to push. Nothing to see here. Twitter still has the New York Post banned from Twitter for tweeting about it. It's really been a remarkable period of time. I mean, look, I personally think both of these are pretty poor candidates to have to be choosing between. I would proudly line up alongside neither of them. But I think it's profoundly concerning for American democracy just how amazingly partisan the media are playing this. Now, in advance of the final debate, you had to wonder how this was going to play out. If I'd been a betting man, I would have bet that Trump would aim to bring the story up and confront Biden with it during the debate. He would probably do it in a less than optimal way and the moderator would quickly try to shut him down. And even if he wasn't shut down between Trump's lack of skill in picking an attack that would actually work and Biden's four days of preparation that, for all we know, was spent exclusively working out how to tackle this point, it wouldn't work that much to the president's advantage. And in the event, that take was broadly correct, although the moderator, Kristen Waker, was much more skillful and gave space for the exchanges while retaining control. In fact, she did a much better job of the approach that I argued for after the last one, giving the candidates the chance to make their pitch and then following up with the hard questions. People have been asking, why did she do so much better than the moderator of the first debate? And that was the main reason. She let them make their strongest pitch first, before then following in with the tough supplementaries. And the supplementaries were also equally tough for both sides. 
Anyway, Trump did indeed pitch for Hunter Biden's story and did so a little bit more coherently than expected, but Biden had a pretty good short-term response prepared, as you might expect. He was able to say, I didn't get a single dollar from overseas and you can look for yourself at my tax returns, which have been published unlike President Trump's. And of course, that was an effective line. So look, here's my overall take on the final debate of the campaign. Both candidates managed to set the bar so low in the previous debate that we're now celebrating a relatively tepid porridge of a debate this time round. Both candidates had good and bad moments. Nobody self-harmed. Nobody landed a killer blow. Biden should probably be celebrating because it won't have changed the momentum, assuming the momentum is the way that the polls attest that they are. Trump did a lot better than last time. If he'd given this performance in the first debate, it might well have made a difference. High points for Trump, pushing clearly for the need for the country to open up. His challenge to Biden on immigration about the famous cages that held children at the border, the fact that it was the Obama-Biden administration that built them. Also, when Biden stepped out of a discussion about China, looked direct into the camera and talked about the kitchen tables of the Americans watching, Trump very effectively pointed to it and called it out as a typical politician's technique. Low points for Trump, saying I am the least racist person in the room is a very weak line, it sounds false. When he was asked to speak to the parents who feel they need to brief their children on how to behave so they won't be victims of police brutality, he avoided the question and it was rather obvious. He had to rein back on his criticism of Anthony Fauci, which he did competently, but all he was doing was damage control, having made the politically incompetent decision previously to unnecessarily attack somebody with a high degree of public trust, purely on a whim, not for a solid campaign reason. High points for Biden. I already mentioned his parrying the attack by putting the focus on the release of tax returns. He also did better on healthcare, particularly when Trump suggested he was promoting socialised medicine. And Biden used the line that he defeated all those people in the primaries. And Trump should pay attention to who he was running against. Low points for Biden. He repeated really bad claims that basically Trump's responsible for all 200,000 people who died from coronavirus, which is a massive overstatement. And he came up with the amazing line, I don't see red and blue states just for United States. And by the way, all the people dying of COVID are in the red states that he just said he didn't see. And that isn't true anyway. Biden also gave us the startling news that the United States had a good relationship with Hitler before he invaded Europe. OK, if you say so. Now, of course, at the end of the debate, they discussed climate change. Most of that was as you would expect. There were no surprises. But the interesting moment came when Trump pushed Biden to say that he would definitely over time, but in an accelerated time frame, shut down the oil industry. And this was Trump's big moment. He said, take note of that. And he reeled off the key swing states with oil interests. This is the fair point of conflict. Because the net zero carbon by 2050 as adopted by the UK and the EU and by 2060 by China, ultimately you're talking about the transition away from fossil fuels. You might as well call it. A managed step-by-step -step transition, slower than the eco-extremists can contemplate for sure, but ultimately yes, a transition. We won't make progress unless we're prepared to have that discussion. Biden pointed to the jobs that will be gained in the new green tech areas. And fair enough, Trump pointed to the jobs that will be lost in the old sectors, although he didn't put a number on them. You should be able to see both sides of that equation when you're talking about this. And we didn't quite get there in this debate, but it's good that the choices were laid out quite clearly both on the question of oil industry and also the question of COVID, locking down or opening up. The debate did present the real nature of the choice between the two candidates. Meanwhile, most of Europe has been locking down again. More parts of the UK have been thrown into higher lockdown status this week, leading the government to have to announce more free cash from the magic money tree to try to keep people barely afloat. So far, it's really hard to know why the country is doing this, except by reference to graphs like this, that keep getting used to show the second wave of cases. Except that so far, 
and these things can always change you watch carefully to be alert to changing conditions but so far when it comes to hospitalizations and deaths those are in line with increases the country would expect at this time of year from respiratory diseases overall Part of the picture is the fact that deaths from influenza and pneumonia have been down in 2020 compared to the five-year average. Given the demographic and health profile of COVID victims, presumably it's because a number of those that would have been taken by influenza in a normal year were taken by COVID instead. You would think this would change the way this is being discussed. Certain basic facts, mainstream, not disputed facts, not wild-eyed 5G conspiracies. The fact that there is an expected upwards curve as we go towards winter. And so far, the increase in hospitalizations and deaths is in line with that curve. Now, that alone doesn't make it impossible that the trajectory doesn't diverge at some point. But we don't normally throw societies into lockdown when we see curves like the ones that we're seeing right now. Add to that the fact that other coronaviruses have not historically produced second waves, certainly not of a similar magnitude to the first, doesn't make one impossible. This is a different virus, but it should make us question harder whether what we're seeing is what we think we're seeing. Then another fact. Although the death toll from COVID was higher than most previous flu seasons, it wasn't uniquely high. Indeed, the seasons between 1993 and 1999 were all higher. Although bear in mind 2020 is not over yet, so that line is going to continue to go up. Nevertheless, we didn't even discuss locking society down in those years. None of this is to say that the decision to treat this differently is a wholly irrational one. There is a case for the defence. People who say Covid is just like flu and not correct as this shows, mortality in the related age groups is significantly higher. And of course it is indeed highly infectious. A report this week did highlight, though, how much less likely to die sufferers are now compared with when the pandemic began, including older people and those with underlying conditions. So this is another factor. It has become more survivable as we've learned how to treat it. Now, should that get factored into lockdown decisions? Probably. However, it's a discussion that is being more batted away than fully embraced. The government's SAGE advisory group rejected the case this week made by the scientists endorsing the Great Barrington Declaration that argued that the non-vulnerable should be allowed to resume normal lives with the hope that in so doing the build-up of herd immunity would eventually reach levels that made it possible for the vulnerable to re-emerge again at a later date. Indeed, one senior SAGE member said that the present wave would lead to tens of thousands of deaths and the government's current tiered approach would not push the numbers down. At some point, the approach of government slipped smoothly from flattening the curve so health services wouldn't get overwhelmed to locking down until a vaccine comes along. That latter policy seems unlikely to hold in a country that's coming to terms with the scale of self-harm that shutting down the economy is doing. That doesn't mean that the policy pushed by the authors of the Great Barrington Declaration will hold either. Sage's criticism that it would be impossible to shield the vulnerable when the general population are spreading it far and wide, that may well be true. Indeed, there's a strong possibility that nobody ever talks about. It could be that we have a lot less agency in all this than we think, and the truth is that nothing we decide to do will actually work. But maybe the differences in outcomes all come down to factors like demographics, health and the strength of the previous year's influenza season. And policy approaches make little dent in that. We don't know. And because people can always claim that even if it doesn't seem to work, it would have been worse if we'd done something different, then we have no way of agreeing. You could make an argument for lockdown at the start, and I supported it at the start. We didn't know anything about COVID-19, except that it looks highly infectious and very dangerous. But we've learned a lot since then. And we've learned a lot of the easy conclusions we jumped to were just wrong, even as we keep jumping to others. One of the things I've commented on a couple of times in the past was the fact that people from ethnic minorities were being held to be at particular risk from COVID-19. 34% of people that have been critically ill from COVID come from an ethnic minority and particularly from the black community. 
significantly above the proportion that would be expected purely from the demographics. I remarked it on the fact that people seemed to be avoiding saying something, just the way they were writing about it. I casually speculated whether it might be some factor like increased rates of obesity, which we know is a factor. And nobody wanted to be implicitly saying people from ethnic minorities are more fat than the rest or something. Given that Public Health England was already speculating that it wasn't just race, but it was racism, the dreaded ism, that was leading to the disparity. That just upped for pressure against plain speaking. And that sort of matters, obviously. Because avoiding actual causes for fear of offending someone can mean that you end up with the wrong policy choices because you don't have accurate information. Well, this week we got the first report back from the government's race disparity unit and their conclusion has been, although there may be a number of factors involved, the simple issue of race is not one of them. Rather, it breaks down to a number of more intuitively obvious factors. People in occupations that give them higher exposure to lots of people, for instance. People who live in larger households, particularly with different generations all living together in close proximity. People who live in cities with high population density. And yes, people with obesity and diabetes and other comorbidities. So this graph showed the risk factors associated with different races compared to that for white men and added up the cumulative difference, which is the black bar. And it shows how black men, because of location, levels of deprivation, household type, occupation and their pre-existing health status, they end up with three times the risk factors of white men. Chinese men, on the other hand, are much closer on all of the different factors and so when they're accumulated together are just one and a half times as likely to have a problem. Here's the equivalent graph for women and most of the risk factors for most groups are somewhat lower, which raises the question whether the higher impact on men rather than women is similarly purely an effect of other risk factors rather than genuinely connected to sex differences. We should take this as an example of how quickly we can take an idea, create a story around it when it happens to fit with a pre-existing concern or interest, even when it makes no rational sense. Blaming COVID-19 on racism was never a rational response to the initial evidence of disparities because it was always much more likely it related to factors in the environment. And it's worth noting how it worked because the same process is daily currency for what we see day in, day out. So the report in June by Public Health England, which was based on the subjective views of 4,000 stakeholders, not research, said this, historic racism and poorer experiences of healthcare or at work may mean that individuals in BAME groups are less likely to seek care when needed, or as NHS staff are less likely to speak up when they have concerns about personal protective equipment or risk. What do we notice about that paragraph that was quoted in coverage about that report? It's all speculation not a scrap of evidence. It's like they had a brainstorm. So people think that racial disparity must be because of racism. Hmm, how would that work? Well, maybe it's because they're so beaten down they don't dare speak up. Yeah, yeah, that sounds good. Write that down. It's worth just training yourself to see this process. It's so many of the headlines right now on this issue. I'm sure on many other issues as well. So, for instance, yesterday, the front page of the Times of London had the headline, Worried Young Help to Slow Spread of COVID-19. We've been told that without action, cases and deaths will spiral upwards exponentially. The sceptics at the same time have been saying, no, the upward bump right now in COVID is in line with standard patterns of seasonal incidence of respiratory diseases. This is what the story said. The rise in coronavirus cases in England has slowed as young people have been frightened into following social distancing rules, officials believe. Officials believe. In other words, apart from the data point about infection rates slowing down, that sentence, which forms the basis for the whole article, is pure speculation. Concern about long COVID has been suggested as one reason for the young changing their behaviour. Has been suggested. Suggested by who? Doesn't say. 
Apparently, student-dominated areas now have 2.5 times the positive test results. The article says cases, but therein lies a bit of an argument as well, down from five times higher a couple of weeks ago. Now, the sceptics would say, we expect this. The spike is nothing like as strong as the original one early in the year. And that's just a theory. It is one way of interpreting the data. It has some good arguments behind it, but we don't know. But it's not even present as a possibility right now. Whatever happens must happen because of what we did or didn't do. It can't just be because of a natural course of events. That's the logic. This is a tendency we do know that human beings are susceptible to. So we should be particularly wary of our propensity to fool ourselves into thinking that it's all down to us. In any case, with no apparent evidence, they're speculating that young people are now scared of long COVID, partly because they need to explain the decrease in the face of the popular perception that students have all been cavorting wildly and irresponsibly. There are numerous theories that might be developed to explain the data. Diving onto one without a shred of evidence and sticking it in your headline as though it were fact, well, one might argue that's a high-risk strategy if you're interested in promoting the truth. I know, call me old-fashioned. Speaking of theories without a shred of evidence, I was a big fan this week of a statement from a UK government minister about critical race theory and its possible influence in education. It came in a parliamentary debate on Black History Month. However, what we are against is the teaching of contested political ideas as if they are accepted facts. We don't do this with communism, we don't do this with socialism, we don't do it with capitalism. And I want to speak about a dangerous trend in race relations that has come far too close to home to my life, and it is the promotion of critical race theory, an ideology that sees my blackness as victimhood and their whiteness as oppression. I want to be absolutely clear, this government stands unequivocally against critical race theory. Yeah. The, so we do not want to see teachers teaching their white pupils about white privilege and inherited yeah. racial guilt. And let me be clear, any school which teaches these elements of critical race theory as fact, or which promotes partisan political views such as defunding the police without offering a balanced treatment of opposing views is breaking the law. If you have the time, it's worth seeing her speech in full. It was a very strong statement of principle about having clarity about the realities of history and what it meant to her as a first generation immigrant to the UK. For some people, merely recommending a speech given by a Conservative would put me beyond the pale. And not just the likes of me, even the iconic Malala, heroine of young bravery in the face of brutality, champion of education for girls. She got cancelled this week because she asked people to support her friend Kia Williams, who was standing for election as president of Oxford University Conservative Association, even as she added a disclaimer saying, this endorsement is not a reflection of my personal political views. As we know, such disclaimers cut no ice and she was quickly demonised by the online woke bullies. From global equal rights icon to despicable tool of the Tories just for the crime of having a friend who is different to her. 87-year-old US Democratic Senator Dianne Feinstein has been experiencing something similar. She was pleasant and decent to a Republican at the conclusion of the confirmation hearings for Amy Coney Barrett. I know! Shocking! Specifically, she praised the committee chairman, Republican Lindsey Graham, telling him that the Barrett hearings were one of the best sets of hearings that I've participated in. She then gave him a hug, which is obviously a big no-no because she might have caught republicanism off him or something. There were waves of angry criticism from the left which resulted in many calling for her to step down from the House Judiciary Committee with few Democratic colleagues prepared to defend her. So in the face of this sort of nonsense, I was pretty taken by a series of ads run by the Utah candidates for governor, Spencer Cox and Chris Peterson. That's right, joint adverts. Here's a taste of one of them. I'm Spencer Cox, your Republican candidate for Utah governor. 
And I'm Chris Peterson, your Democratic candidate for governor. We are currently in the final days of campaigning against each other. But our common values transcend our political differences, and the strength of our nation rests on our ability to see that. We are both equally dedicated to the American values of democracy, liberty, and justice for all people. We just have different opinions on how to achieve those ideals. But today, we are setting aside those differences to deliver a message that is critical for the health of our nation. That whether you vote by mail or in person, Person, we will fully support the results of the upcoming presidential election, regardless of the outcome. Although we sit on different sides of the aisle, we are both committed to American civility and a peaceful transition of power. I think that's a great thing to have done. Ultimately, the system only works with a degree of common support for and understanding of how the system works. If you can't agree sufficiently to handle the peaceful transfer of power, you don't have a democracy. Full stop. Although it also says something about the toxicity of current discourse when you decide it's the sort of thing you actually have to do. And even calling for respect can fall foul of the new censors. Brett Weinstein, leading light in what used to be called the intellectual dark web and promoter of a third way in polarised politics, tweeted earlier today that he had been ejected from Facebook. The message from Facebook is pretty chilling. Your account has been disabled. You can't use Facebook because your account or activity on it didn't follow our community standards. We have already reviewed this decision and it can't be reversed. And yet, very quickly, Facebook comms person Liz Bourgeois tweeted, your account was mistakenly flagged by our system for identifying imposter accounts. We've restored it and are sorry for the mistake. And yet, the notice said it had been reviewed, not just flagged by the algorithm. No appeal possible. No reversal. These are the organisations now slapping notices on content they don't like or taking it down. This is one important reason why having the support of patrons is so important to content creators who step into controversial issues, as I do on this channel. I certainly wouldn't be able to do so without the good people who support me at patreon.com forward slash Malin Baker. If you would like to add your support to theirs for the independent, fact-focused and non-ideological content that I aim to produce here, please sign up at, once again, patreon.com forward slash Malin Baker. That support is always appreciated. Either way, have a great week. My name's Malin Baker. This is The Malin Baker Show.